and uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time in this verse. But let me begin by talking about sport because that's my default mechanism uh, for most discussions and most conversations. And I want to start with rugby league. Uh, I wasn't a great rugby league player. I played hooker. Uh, All I had to do was pick up the ball after the dummy half and pass it to someone else. Uh, I was nothing like Mal Meninga. Uh, Hands up here if you know who Mal Meninga is. Good, I've at least got 50%. That's terrific. In December 2015, Mal Meninga was appointed the coach of the Australian Rugby League team. Uh, If you remember Mal from his playing days, he played for the Raiders. Uh, He played for... (laughs) He played for Queensland. Uh, he, in the latter part of his career, he, he played most matches with a huge arm guard on, which made him more imposing. Uh, he had had a glittering career, and he said that his appointment as the coach of the Kangaroos probably rounds off my career. Uh, at the time he was appointed, the Kangaroos were struggling under Tim Sheens. Who's he coaching at the moment? No, I won't go there. Uh, under Tim Sheens, they were struggling, and they had gone down so, to the point where they'd lost the last three games to New Zealand of all teams. Many doubted whether Australia would ever get back to the top of that massive pile called International Rugby League. In 2023, we can look back and see that Mal Meninga's done an all right job, hasn't he? Uh, Since his appointment, they've not been defeated. They've won the World Cup twice without some of their strongest players. England even decided they'd pinch Wayne Bennett to see if he could help. And we did away with them and we did away with New Zealand. Uh, Many who are interested in rugby league have tried to analyse what Mal Meninga did, but his players have said he just made it simple. He distilled what we were on about down to our core values. He came up with an acronym, R-I-S-E, RISE. Uh, And if you watch footage, you'll notice a lot of the players have that written on their wrist tape as they play in that period of time. Respect, inspire, selfless, excellence. Rise. It was a simple statement, four words, any rugby league player can remember that many words, and it reminded them of what they're on about. It distilled their core values down to this is who we are, not just as players on the pitch, but as men off the pitch. Uh, Such summaries are helpful, aren't they? Uh, Many of us have them, don't we? A little acronyms or little summaries that remind us of what we're on about. Now, they don't cover everything, but they get to the guts, don't they? They get to the guts of something. But what are we on about here? What are we on about here? Or how would we summarise what we do as a mob that's really diverse, who are gathered here each week, who call ourselves Christians, not just in these four walls, but hopefully as we go out into our town, how would we summarise what we're on about here? For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Longer than four words, but there are four ideas and we're going to look at them briefly now. Let me pray and then we're going to look at this verse together. God, thanks for your word. Uh, We actually sit here in great luxury, Father. Uh, We can sit here in peace with Uh, no uh, threat to our lives. We can open the Bible. Uh, We look forward to Tucker. Uh, Father, thank you for your incredible grace in this way. Father, help us not to be apathetic in that grace or lazy. Help us not to take your kindness for granted. Help us to understand who we are and to be generous with that truth and with all that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, There are four biographies of Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, uh, written by people who were close followers. This one is taken from John's account of Jesus' life. Uh, It's in a part where uh, I think John's actually pausing and summarising what Jesus is on about. Uh, Just in a few verses early on in the biography, he wants to nail his colours to the mast. And at the heart of what he says, at the heart of who we are as God's mob, is this truth here. God loves the world. Uh, Now let me be blunt with you. Uh, that's not an idea that our world necessarily accepts or agrees with, and I I really understand that. I can understand that sentiment. Uh, Some people view God as a made-up character, a a kind of celestial sky daddy that blokes like me have made up to have a job and to have a crutch. Uh, Some people view God as a disinterested old man who can't quite remember where he's put the world, and so he just wanders through the universe. 
Other people view God as someone who's quite vindictive, judgmental, even negligent. I mean, if he's got that many powers, well, why is he not using them in a better way? And even if we do accept that God loves the world, and many of us do, uh, we look at the world and we look at ourselves and we lament, don't we? <laughs> you know that barrage of headlines that comes through our news feeds and our social media? Uh, you know the pain and brokenness we feel in ourselves, uh, if not in our hearts, at least in our knees? And we wonder whether anyone could love such a world or such a person. But this verse actually says God does. It's a pretty remarkable claim, isn't it? It's a remarkable claim about God. God is loving. It's a remarkable claim about us in this world that someone could love this. And it's a remarkable claim about God's love that it's actually been expressed in time and space. And we'll get to that in a moment. Now, don't get me wrong. Love doesn't make life easy. (laughs) Think of a devoted and loving parent and their child. If that parent loves their child, then they will do some things with that child that they might not necessarily enjoy, won't they? (laughs) They'll discipline them, rebuke them. They'll work hard to show them how to be a person in this world. And that's not always going to be easy, but the love remains. Uh, Don't misunderstand me either. Love loves regardless. That same child at 2am who's been crying for five hours, who is snotty, who has kept you awake, you love them. That same child who's grown up and rebelled against you, hurt you, disappointed you and rejected you, you love them. We know those truths, don't we? But let me also be clear, love must be expressed. It's no use me in Australia saying God loves you and they're not giving you evidence. That's not the way Australians work, is it? (laughs) Uh, We want to see the facts. We want to see God put his money where his mouth is. And God does. God expresses his love for the world in a particular way. In this way, he gave his one and only son. Uh, We know the connection between loving and giving, don't we? And we do it each year at Christmas and we do it on birthdays for no other reason that we love the person. Giving a gift expresses love. Uh, Our gifts range from the quirky, the personal, sometimes the romantic, and sometimes, yes, it's the vacuum cleaner board on a birthday that's practical. But look at what God gives. Did you notice that? Does God give a key ring, a bunch of flowers, a car, a career. No, God gives his boy. Why don't you just think on that? God gives his boy. His one and only boy. I haven't met a historian who says a bloke called Jesus didn't exist. Jesus was historically real. He was born, he was raised in a family, he had a mum and dad, he had four brothers and a couple of sisters. A surprise, surprise, he actually had a trade. He was a chippy for at least 15 years. But above all, he was the son of God, a display of God's love to the world. God's love is historical and real. It it exists in flesh and blood. It has calluses. It sleeps. It eats. He grows tired. God's love exists in real time and space, walks in dirt, has a bed, a home. He has flesh like us and he's a human like us. We are serious as God's mob about God loving the world in a particular way through his boy, through Jesus who lived as a real human. Now, there are a lot of other questions that will come up about that. That's why we have morning tea or a question time after the sermon. But we know at least this. God loves the world and he showed it in a bloke called Jesus who actually existed. If you want to meet God's love, who do you need to meet? You need to meet Jesus. If you want to meet God, you go and talk to Jesus. That's what we're on about, introducing people to that black in this world. What kind of world is it? Well, it's an interesting world, isn't it? I don't think I'm telling you anything that you don't know when I say that the third idea is that this world is perishing. That's actually the default mechanism of the world and its inhabitants. Now, it's hard to believe that on a morning like this because it really is a glorious morning. 
I said to people on the front lawn before church, you can almost hear the grass growing, can't you? The rain's been magnificent. The air is crisp. It's that kind of autumn we have for two weeks in Narrabri. It's a delightful morning, isn't it? The world is beautiful. Some places, though, in the world are a little bit too wet at the moment, aren't they? Some places are a little bit too dry. Some places they can't meet like this because they don't know when the drones will come. Other places have famine. That's decimating thousands and thousands of acres and people. It's a beautiful world. It's a broken world, isn't it? It's just like us. We're beautiful people. But we're broken people, aren't we? Each of us knows the truth of that. We're innately valuable and precious and lovely. But we're broken people too, aren't we? And the world is broken. I've never met anyone in nearly 15 years of parish ministry in this neck of the woods who's come up to me and said, Bernard, this is as good as it gets. I want to give you just a brief example of that. Yeah, You might know this example. It's taken from another sport, funnily enough, but this time running. Uh, on March 14, 2013, Iram Leon won the Gusher Marathon in Beaumont, Texas. That'll get you a trivial pursuit answer, I tell you at one point. He ran three hours and seven minutes. That's not a bad time for a marathon. It was made even more impressive that his six-year-old daughter beat him because she was in the running pram he was pushing. <laughs> made even more remarkable by the fact that he was suffering a terminal brain tumour that was expected to kill him by the time he was 40. Uh, to all intents and purposes on the outside, he's a, a fit and healthy, loving father. Well, loving taking your daughter for a marathon. But he was broken, wasn't he? He's a dead man walking. He's an image of all of us. For some of us, the brokenness is a little more obvious. For others, we can hide the brokenness a bit better. But we're all perishing, aren't we? We might not look like it. We might not want to acknowledge it, but all of us are perishing and we see that truth in the fact that all of us will die. The root cause of that, oh, there are other causes, the root cause is not often that obvious. It's a very simple root cause. It's something the Bible calls sin. Sin's the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. Uh, if you want to distill it even further, sin is just like the word. It has I in the middle. It's where I say I can do a better job than God. And as people have heard me here uh, a number of times, a seven billion gods in the world doesn't really work, does it? Put more seriously, it puts us at odds with God. We might be openly antagonistic to God. We might even say that we hate God. We might be in open warfare against God. We might be just apathetic towards God, maybe even quietly and stubbornly resistant. We might even not even care about God. But this verse tells us that all humans are at odds with God. We're his enemies. And God gives us what we want. That's his judgment. He says, if you want to have life without me, you can. But the opposite of life without God who gives life is, well, it's death, isn't it? It's death, and the world is perishing. That's the world we live in. And, and do you remember what we've just heard about God? For God loved this world, a perishing world, a world set against him. God loved this world in this way. He gave his one and only son. Always poses to me, I don't know if it poses you. When was the last time I showed that love to my friends, let alone my enemies? Why would God do this? Well, this is the last idea. God does this so that the perishing might live. God does this so that the perishing might live. God's love is for his enemies. His love is not about being a snowplow that kind of smooths everything in front of you and makes life easy. His love is not about making life more enjoyable or cruisy. His love is about giving life to his enemies, dealing with their greatest need. And he does this by giving his son. Uh, don't get, get me wrong, Jesus is a good role model. But he's not just a good role model, is he? 
Jesus is the bloke we need to step in and die for us. He lives the life we couldn't live, and then he dies for us, taking all of that judgment of God against his enemies on himself. He stands in for us, and then he walks out of the grave to show that he's done his job and God's love is good. And what do we do? Because there's always a catch, isn't there? We can't buy it. We certainly don't earn it. We won't, by our own bootstraps, pull ourselves up to live the way we should. Do you notice what we need to do, if you can call it that? We just need to receive it. We just need to receive it. It's available to any who believe. There's no key performance indicators. There's no moral standard you have to reach. You don't have to be of a certain social demographic, employed, unemployed, been to jail or not. It's available to who? All who believe. And believe in this sense is not just, yes, I I, I sent to the fact that a bloke called Jesus was there. Believe in this sense is trusting. Believe in this sense is knowing the truth and then living like it, receiving what God has done for you, accepting that we have a problem, that I'm perishing, that God has a solution, that he loves me in Jesus, that it means coming back to him because of what Jesus has done so that God is where he should be, in charge. So what are we on about here? How would you distill what we're on about? I'm sorry, I can't give you an acronym that you write on a wristband. (laughs) But this is what we're on about here. God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son, so that in a perishing world, those who trust in Jesus might live. That's what we're on about. We are a bunch of sinners who know we are perishing, who know God loves us by Jesus Christ and know that that is available to any person, no matter where they are from or who they are. If that is news to you, come and see me over morning tea. If you have questions about that, fill out that flyer in the newsletter and whack it in the money box up the back. If you are already part of God's mob, please don't complicate it. It's really that simple. God loved a perishing world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him might live. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Our Father, there are some really complicated things and there are some really simple things and this is simple and we thank you for it. Thank you that you love a perishing world. You show it in your son and thank you that in him our greatest need can be met. Father, help us to know that truth, help us to live that truth, help us to share that truth. In Jesus' name, amen.